Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, I'm delighted to get to, pron uh, to pronounce Elizabeth Jarrison is our next speaker from the University of Chicago in the Department of Physics. Take it away, Elizabeth. Great. All right, thanks so much uh, for having me here today. I've, I've learned a lot and it's uh, been a really uh, interesting meeting. Um, so uh, I want to tell you uh, why I think uh, the dynamics of uh, community inflammation uh, in, in in vivo systems is is an is an interesting uh, and exciting problem, uh, perhaps for this for this community. Um, so my slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, this is going to be this may be a little interesting um, presentation wise if it's that laggy. Um, so so uh, our immune system uh, is a dynamical defense uh, against pathogens. Um, and uh, the, the thing that's really fascinating about the system is that uh, it has to be able to respond to some kind of unexpected challenge that occurs somewhere in your body um, and flare up uh, and uh, clear an infection and then return to homeostasis. Um, and uh, so, so uh, this is a, a process that's now uh, fairly well understood biologically, um, but uh, the questions of how length and time scales, for example, in the system are, are controlled um, is, is, is almost entirely open. Um, so, uh, so what's going on uh, uh, underneath the hood biologically uh, very briefly? Um, so there are specific molecules that are associated with uh, either with tissue damage uh, and also with uh, foreign agents like pathogens, um, which are detected by uh, so-called sentinel uh, resident immune cells, principally macrophages and some others. Um, and these uh, start secreting a, a bunch of uh, proteins called cytokines as well as small molecules, um, which go and uh, turn on other cells, uh, including they instruct blood vessels to dilate um, and uh, for the cells lining blood vessels to open up gaps, uh, which then allow more immune cells called neutrophils um, uh, and also uh, more cells that become macrophages to crawl out into tissue. And it's uh, this influx of, of immune cells and fluid into tissue that causes this cardinal signs of inflammation, which are redness, pain, swelling, and heat, uh, but that also take care uh, of an infection uh, and help repair a wound. So uh, some very broad phenomenology that I think uh, hints to this at this being a really interesting uh, system uh, is the following. So the, the, this, uh, we can colloquially say that the system is, is in some sense balanced in a knife's edge. Um, because if you remove uh, any small component, um, things can go terribly wrong. Um, so one example of this is that uh, uh, individuals can be born uh, with a, a genetic mutation that makes their neutrophils uh, unable to crawl out into tissue. Um, so this is, uh, this is called leuco leukocyte uh, adhesion deficiency. So you have neutrophils, but they just can't migrate out. Um, and this is unfortunately lethal in infancy if not treated. Uh, these individuals have rampant uh, soft tissue infections. So this uh, suggests that in all of us, uh, our in, especially our innate immune system is actually taking care of infections underneath the surface that, uh, that we never perceive. Um, uh, so this is too little inflammation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can also knock out, uh, uh, so this is one of actually several repressors of an important cytokine called, called uh, IL-1B, which is one of these uh, molecules that I just mentioned that, that starts off these inflammatory processes. Um, and uh, if you're missing the receptor of, the, uh, excuse me, one of the repressors of this protein, um, this is actually also uh, lethal in infancy. Um, uh, these individuals, if not treated, these individuals have uh, rampant skin and bone uh, auto-inflammation. So we have sort of a, uh, a very loose picture of a system that somehow appears to be hovering, uh, ready to spike uh, up and take care of something at any, at any given time. Um, and, uh, uh, but somehow kept under control. Um, and so the, the very broad question is, is how the cells in our body are able to collectively interpret molecular signals to respond sensitively without running away. So uh, one uh, theoretical approach to this uh, problem that, that uh, I think is, is quite interesting and, and, and promising um, uh, that, has, that has been taken um, is uh, so in the framework of uh, re reaction diffusion um, models. So, uh, so, what, so 
what's happening in these models is that um, uh, there are uh, cells, uh, many sometimes these uh, immune cells are motile, um, and they and other tissue cells can secrete different signals, um, which will then go and bind to other cells, which cause secretion of these and perhaps other signals. Um, and uh, uh, and so uh, uh, this is, I think, so so this is a, a framework in which to start thinking about uh, how these systems can potentially uh, uh, create such responses. Um, but uh, uh, and and I think and there's been uh, some really quite interesting work along these lines. Um, but it's in many ways almost too unconstrained um, in the sense that. Uh, there's, there's sort of the sky is the limit in terms of interesting dynamics that can occur in such a system. Um, and so uh, what I'm really interested in is uh, how in, 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 in real systems, how are these types of, of which of these types of dynamical regimes occur? How are they controlled? Um, and, and more than that, you know, it's, it's not totally clear that this is sort of the right framework. Uh, are there ways in which these systems will surprise us entirely and, and do something maybe entirely new? Um, so uh, our uh, main goal is to try to investigate this uh, broad area experimentally. Um, and uh, our main uh, platform for this is uh, zebrafish. Um, and uh, the reason for, uh, for using this system is that um, they turn out to have uh, all of the same immune cells as uh, mammals do, as we do. Um, uh, but they have a huge advantage, which is that uh, as, as larvae, they are uh, very small and optically transparent. Um, and so uh, we can do uh, some direct imaging of the dynamics of these cell populations, um, uh, uh, as well as, so I'm, I'm not going to talk uh, about today, but would love to talk online um, about uh, ways in which uh, we can start to measure uh, responses of, of these cells uh, to perturbations, um, as well as uh, directly uh, introduce uh, tunable stimuli uh, to, to, to really get control over some of the knobs uh, in these systems uh, using light. Uh, so what I'm going to do with uh, uh, the, the time that I have today, uh, depending on uh, uh, how that time frame goes, um, is to uh, mainly to tell a vignette about really just one very small piece of this puzzle, which is uh, a specific problem and uh, in, in starting to get some understanding of uh, how the cells explore their in vivo environment. And this will be a story about, about T cells, but that I think has some uh, general lessons for uh, cell motility. Um, and then if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about a different uh, type of measurement uh, that we can make to start to get a handle on how some of all of the rest of these cells in, in tissue uh, uh, are signaling to one another. Um, and uh, so, so, and I should mention, so this is, uh, uh, this is an, just one uh, image from uh, an early uh, transgenic that we've, that we've made in the lab. Um, this is uh, a mosaic individual where uh, some nuclei and cell membranes are, are labeled um, with a fluorescent protein. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, and so uh, these, and these, uh, these sort of large pavement stone kinds of cells are, are, are epithelial cells uh, in a layer in this, in this fish. Yes. Is like nuclear blaring common in those kind of cells? Ah, so right. So what's ha so what's happening here? This is in some sense maybe a bit too complex of an image for this, but uh, we have introduced a, a type of immune stimulation here, which is which is a cut. Um, and so there's a, a this the debris that you see here is actually and and of beginnings of some cell death and so forth is actually because of that in this in this case. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, and and um, one of the things that one of the things that I think uh, unifies just this is just a simple thing that we've uh, I think started learning empirically about this system is is that uh, in general with these systems there's really uh, a lot of noise um, in the sense that uh, uh, cells are quite heterogeneous um, and I think it's interesting to think about. Uh, how these sort of uh, sorts of random variables might uh, perhaps influence uh, the responses that we see. Okay, so uh, so uh, what I'm going to mainly tell you about is is a story about uh, uh, simply how T cells uh, explore tissue, um, and uh, so this uh, grew out of a puzzle that I think uh, has not yet been fully resolved, um, which is that so 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 T cells are an interesting type of uh, of 
um, adaptive in B-cell. Um, one of the reasons that they're interesting is that each of them has effectively its own unique receptor, um, which uh, only recognizes a very small fraction of, of what's called antigens, so small peptides that are displayed on particular thing, particular antigen presenting cells. Um, and so, uh, so there's, there's a, a longstanding puzzle about how uh, these cells are actually able to find uh, their targets in vivo. Um, and because if you think about it, chemotaxis is actually not a solution to this problem. Chemotaxis can get you to the right zone, but it's not possible for the correct cell that has the correct uh, antigen for this particular T cell to attract that cell. Um, and indeed, the first uh, measurements of, uh, from explanted uh, mouse lymph nodes uh, over short time showed that uh, the cells are doing some kind of <coughs> some kind of a random walk. And uh, this, uh, so this raises the question of, of how is this uh, an efficient enough search um, at a very sort of back of the envelope level? Um, if you allow a T cell to dwell near another cell for something like a minute long enough for it to become activated, it seems like it would take it an extremely long time, like something like many, many days to cross a tissue type scale like a millimeter. So one of the proposals was that instead the cells are uh, doing some sort of more exotic random walk like levy flight, um, which is a scale free process uh, uh, where uh, steps are chosen from some kind of parallel distribution such that the mean squared displacement remains super diffusive uh, at long times. Um, and so, uh, uh, but this is uh, difficult to distinguish from something more pedestrian like a persistent random walk um, over shorter time scales. And so we were interested in, in whether or not there was support for, for this kind of uh, behavior from the T cells. Um, so we observed a population of T cells uh, in uh, the, the, the the tail fin of the zebrafish. So these are present in two layers um, on the, the top and bottom surfaces of, of the tail fin. Um, and uh, uh, decided to simply observe what these cells were doing. Um, so to do these observations, um, I uh, built a simple uh, light sheet microscope. Um, and uh, so uh, what we do here is just to effectively make a sheet of light and scan the sample through the sheet, collecting a plane of uh, of um, data at, at each at each uh, step to create a, a Z stack or volume scale, um, and uh, the reason to do this is that we can uh, image fairly fast over large fields of view um, and uh, uh, get get optical sectioning. Um, uh, but perhaps most importantly, it's uh, photo tolerant uh, such that you can collect many more time points prior to uh, photo bleaching and, and damaging the system. Uh, so this enables us to watch uh, the cells run around. Um, so this is a maximum Z projection into the plane of the tail of the zebrafish. Um, and we have constitutively GFP labeled T cells, uh, which are uh, uh, exploring uh, interstitial spaces. Um, and now uh, zooming a little in a little bit so that we can uh, see what they're doing in a little bit more detail. Um, so this movie is much sped up. So this is gonna be over three hours of real time. Um, and again, so, so there are also T cells in circulation. Occasionally, you will just catch one zoom by. Um, but uh, what we're seeing here is, again, uh, they're adhered to extracellular matrix, and they're crawling by renucleating their actin cytoskeleton. This is uh, amoeboid motility um, uh, in, in interstitial spaces uh, uh, in, in the zebrafish uh, tail. Um, and these uh, are, are computed tracks that were uh, that I'm, that I'm superimposing so that we can see some examples of, of where the cells have been. So, right. so, uh, so first, uh, to address this question about levy flight, um, so we can simply measure the mean squared displacement um, over time. Um, and uh, it does look like uh, it turns over. Um, and a uh, slightly different perspective on this data, we can just look at the um, velocity, velocity, power spectrum. And again, you see a very clear uh, intermediate time scale uh, at the, the, the time scale on which the directions decorrelate. Um, and so this, uh, yes. So in the movie that you just showed, some yes. cells just move way further than others. Yes, is I'm a, different populations. Uh, yeah, so this is what I'm about to talk about. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, but, but I will, and then I'll have maybe more more to say at the end. Um, so, um, how when when are we oh, when are we done? How far into? Yeah, no, I, it's oh, well, yeah, okay, good. We'll go for thirteen hours. Okay, all right, all right. That's that's great. That's um, 
so okay, so um, right. So as was just uh, so okay. So as was just pointed out, uh, the sort of the most I think the most one of the most obvious features of of this of this movie is is the following that uh, uh, there's there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity uh, across the cells. So some of them simply go much further than others, right? And so one way of of pulling this out a bit more quantitatively is looking at uh, uh, speed traces. So these are secant approximated speeds along trajectories. So these are four example trajectories that we were looking at before. Um, so these are example trajectories. So, so, you know, sp speed fluctuates uh, along a given trajectory, right? But, uh, but it seems like there's uh, uh, these, these cells really have each have their own individual distribution, one can say. Um, and this is true of, of the trajectories in general. So for most of them are inconsistent with having been drawn from the overall speed distribution. Um, so uh, we can, so one option is to take the mean speed to be the, a property of the trajectory, um, suggesting the following very simple model of the cell's motility, which is simply a, a classic uh, uh, ornstein ullenbeck or persistent random walk uh, model um, for, for the, for, so this is the Langevin equation for the velocities. Um, so it has two parameters, the, the persistence time and uh, the cell speed. So the persistence time controls effectively the time scale on which the directions decorrelate, um, and the speed uh, sets the, the scale for the velocities. Um, and together, they determine the effective uh, diffusion constant. Um, so uh, and this is uh, just a simulated speed trace. Um, so the hypothesis is that uh, there's effectively an S for each cell, which sets the distribution of speeds. Um, so, uh, but what about this P parameter? So prior literature actually suggested that in this system, uh, in amoeboid migrating cells, there might be a relationship between uh, S and P. So um, we measured this in our system and indeed actually uh, they found support for a linear relationship between uh, the persistence time and the speed of a cell. Uh, so this suggests an even simpler model of the cell's motility, uh, which is that we can simply plug in the relationship we measured between uh, speeds and uh, persistence times. Um, and uh, so if this is a reasonably good uh, uh, description of, of the cell's motility, then uh, two things should be true. So first of all, uh, diffusion scaling should be obeyed. Uh, so, uh, uh, so if we scale out by the, the time at different, um, over different time intervals, uh, this, we should measure the same effective diffusion constant uh, at times longer than the persistence time. Um, and then, uh, uh, in addition, uh, it predicts a, a scaling with, with cell speed that's just a bit steeper than the S squared that you might otherwise see. Um, so uh, when we do that, uh, when we look at that and, and at, for cells uh, of different speeds, um, we do see that uh, uh, this data collapses um, uh, as, as so diffusion scaling is respected. Um, and uh, there's a slightly steeper scaling uh, given by this extra kick uh, because faster cells actually just go straighter. Um, yes. Sorry. So this S, is it an intrinsic property of a cell or is it a yes. cell's location's property? Yes. So as far as we can tell, it is not, it does not have anything to do with the location. Um, uh, we believe that it is, is, it is an intrinsic property of the cell. Um, let me, let me um, just finish this little part and then I'll flip to the end and show you uh, what, so there's been some nice uh, in vitro work that's, uh, that uh, actually on a different type of amoeboid, amoeboid migrating cell, but that I think uh, that suggests actually, I think a, a, a very good idea of what the mechanism for this is. Um, uh, but in this system, you know, we can't measure directly, but, I, 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 but I'll, I'll tell you what I think the answer to this is. Um, but yes, I think it's, I do think it's an intrinsic property of the cell. Um, so uh, so uh, sort of phenomenologically what you see is, is that there's really a huge range of effective uh, diffusion uh, uh, constants across this, uh, <coughs> across the population. Um, and most of that is due to this speed variation. And then there's this sort of little extra kick that has to do with uh, this correlation between uh, the straightness and speed. Uh, so uh, the, the final thing that I want to say is that so so uh, it, at least from from our measurements at this um, uh, at this initial point uh, you know we don't have we don't have any sense that the cells are, are interacting <laughs> with one another. Where this the model is simply is um, uh, uh, non-interacting Brownian walkers. Um, uh, but uh, but the difference between this and and something like gas is that uh, each of these guys essentially has has its own. Uh, 
uh, effective diffusion constant, um, uh, which we think uh, changes over time scales of a few hours. So it's not that it doesn't change, but it's sort of a slowly changing variable um, uh, that's very broadly distributed in the population. Uh, okay, so um, so so the, the um, uh, so the conclusion is that so we started with this question of uh, how do cells access many scales, um, and uh, uh, what's suggested by this data is is really just that by having many speed set points, essentially, um, which really just opens the question of how the speed is influenced by uh, immune cell signals in tissue um, and raises, I, I think, the sort of the possibility that. Uh, uh, essentially what these cells are doing to implement a reasonably efficient search is uh, getting integrating signals in their local environment for some amount of time to then decide how fine of a, how fine of a search to do in that area. Um, and then if nothing interesting is there, speeding up again and so forth. So it's essentially, which uh, this is a, something that's sometimes called orthotaxis. Um, uh, so that's, uh, so this isn't something that, that, that I can prove, but uh, I think is, is maybe suggested uh, by this data. Um, and uh, in, in general, uh, uh, I, I think that it's, uh, uh, we expect that it's true of, of various immune cells that are exploring these tissue environments that, that, uh, that the, uh, uh, in the absence of, of sort of strong chemotactic signals, uh, the walkers are approximately individual uh, uh, Brownian uh, walkers, but with just a, this very broad range of uh, behaviors across the population. Um, okay, yes. Do you know anything about the, the reason microscopic mechanism of the correlation? I mean, this is very- Yeah, yeah, about. okay. So yes, yes. So let me go to a slide for that, and then we will maybe very briefly show you a little bit of other data. Ah, okay. Um, okay. Oh yes. So right. So this is just uh, this is this weird this weird speed uh, speed uh, straightness correlation is uh, also true in uh, other. These are T cells in mice, and this is dictostelium. Um, so, uh, so uh, the the right. So the uh, mechanism um, that is uh, really best explored in this um, paper by Mary, um, which I maybe have a reference, which I should have a reference to on this slide, but don't. Maybe have it sitting on a different slide. But is that um, so? Uh, the, the, the suggestion is that every cell has essentially a, um, a, has a, a concentration of free actin monomers, um, which is acts essentially like a chemical um, like a chemical potential and sets uh, the rate at which actin is nucleated onto the actin cytoskeleton, and uh, that that controls both speed and straightness. That uh, the faster you're nu you're adding actin um, to the cytoskeleton, the the faster you move on average, and and also but also the longer time you're persistent for. Um, and they have some very good uh, in vitro experiments that suggest that this is that this is why these cells are act like that. Is there um, a clear evolutionary advantage for this? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't. I think I I don't I don't I won't, wouldn't Did make any have claims. Any infections for this? Um, I. I, in this case, I don't. I, I have. I'm, I wouldn't want to make any claims about that. Um, uh, I, you know, I think it could just be a quirk of uh, a quirk of amoeboid migration, uh, uh, rather than having, rather than being functionally significant. Um, I wonder if the analog in E. coli, the more data you have, the less frequent you switch. What kind of philosophy that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't, it's an interesting so, question. I, yeah. yeah. So one thought I had is like these T cells are known to migrate faster through smaller constrictions, right? So if you subject them to more confinement, they move faster because of the uh, the, the friction due to cortical uh, actin. So that is also known sort of like for other uh, mammalian cells when you put them in tinier strings. So so if your tissue has heterogeneity in terms of like pore spaces, they are gonna shoot up if. In a tighter pore space. Yeah, but there's no good reason why that will, why that, well, I don't think there's any good reason why that would cause correlations uh, over the scale of a, a couple of hours of migration of a given cell. Like this cell went fa systematically fast, right? So it sped up and slowed. Like I think that that almost probably could well affect uh, these these um, shorter time scale fl speed fluctuations, right? Like the cells are speeding up and slowing down. Uh, quite a bit, like they're turning around and so forth. But then there's, uh, there's the, the claim is that there's, uh, 
uh, there is this underlying set point, essentially, um, uh, which is independent of the, the details of the current physical environment. Um, and it's not to say the physical environment doesn't matter. It surely does. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, okay. So let's see. I have how much time? Um, so uh, I just um, I, I have you said till yeah I have a couple of minutes oh, so I'll just uh, just extremely briefly uh, mention that uh, so one of the so we are interested in we are quite interested in making uh, both dynamical measurements and perturbations uh, uh, that allow us to address things like how uh, signaling amongst these cells uh, is controlled uh, in in vivo. Um, and I, I just uh, wanted to briefly uh, show, um, so, so one of the questions uh, that's, that's still open in systems like this is really uh, a fairly basic empirical one about whether or not um, most of the signaling that takes place is between sort of isolated sentinel immune cells who are themselves also motile, but potentially run around with their own little signaling clouds, or whether there's also a lot of involvement of all these cells in the continuum. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that I think that this is sort of a uh, uh, fun fundamental question, uh, uh, if we want to address how information is propagated in the system, um, is inspired by models like this, where, you know, if you have uh, communication directly between cells in the continuum, um, uh, there's, there's um, many types of phenomena, like, for example, a propagation of signaling waves through tissue um, that can occur through, this is, uh, uh, this is dependent very crucially on there being um, essentially relay activation where um, there is a, a cytokine produced by uh, one of these uh, uh, one of these cells here. This is a purely a continuum model, but uh, one imagines cells underneath um, one of these cells here. Uh, and then the next cell receives that molecule and starts producing more of the same molecule. So uh, and so so but the question of whether or not uh, these sort of continuous sheets of cells even uh, even produce the right kinds of signals for this is, is not is not well understood. Um, so uh, one of the types of uh, measurements that we've been doing um, is uh, a static snapshots of uh, which of the genes uh, these uh, cells turn on during a, a model inflammatory response in which we expose the entire uh, fish to a bath of uh, one of the classic pathogen associated molecular patterns. Um, and so, so these, uh, uh, so you know, you could, one can pick up some uh, candidate genes, uh, uh, which uh, it seems like these epithelial cells are producing. Um, and um, these are interesting. There are um, so a lot of proteins that go uh, degrade extracellular matrix to allow immune cells to infiltrate, as well as um, some of the enzymes needed for synthesizing small molecules, um, which uh, direct blood vessels to dilate. This is actually the gene that's the target of ibuprofen and many other NSAIDs. Um, and actually, probably most interesting for this case is uh, this cytokine IL-1B, which is known to be one of these auto-activating uh, 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 apical cytokines. Um, so uh, one thing that we can do is, is to uh, label uh, these RNA molecules in uh, fixed whole mount uh, tail fin tissue samples. So this is a fish that was exposed to uh, this bath of the stimulating molecule um, uh, for 10 hours. Um, and uh, one of the most interesting features of this, so, uh, so the genes turn on um, and we can, uh, uh, we can uh, at least pseudo segment into cell-based regions and count spots that are associated with RNA molecules uh, for these genes that are responding to the signal. Um, and uh, so, so one of the, the features of this data, which is interesting, uh, but and I think not a surprise to uh, people who have thought of, about um, first D transcription and things like this, but is that uh, you know, even under this uniform stimulus, um, uh, the cells uh, turn on very heterogeneously, right? So uh, this is you know, visually apparent here, and the, the, the distribution of activation have these, these relatively uh, heavy tails and are quite broad compared to what you would expect from just um, a, a simple binomial null from uh, 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 technical uh, variation in spot counting. Um, and uh, probably even more interesting than that, um, uh, the cell, so, so even given that a particular cell activates, um, it will, at least at first, at sort of intermediate levels of activation, it will turn on essentially a random set of these genes. Um, so there's just, just quite a lot of, uh, of variability 
uh, in in um, even that a, given that a cell received a signal, uh, which uh, of these genes turn on? Um, again, uh, quite a bit above sort of what you, of of what you would expect from technical noise. Um, and so, uh, uh, so uh, one of the reasons that I think this is interesting is is just uh, that I think the the system sort of has to contend with. Uh, uh, if there's going to be something like a signal propagating, uh, how that occurs through uh, what, is in, what is in fact such a heterogeneous environment in terms of what a given cell will, will even do in response to uh, a cytokine signal. Um, and uh, with that, thank you uh, so much uh, for, for uh, inviting me here and uh, uh, for the interesting talks. Um, and um, so I have a, also a, a very young lab at the University of Chicago um, uh, and um, would love to actually talk about some of the, the new work that, that we are doing along these lines. Um, and uh, this uh, work was done um, in my postdoc uh, with Stephen Craig at, at Stanford uh, University. Um, and I'd be happy to take more questions if we have time. Well, uh, it looks like we have a coffee break right now, well, so you have until the next 15 minutes to ask all the questions that you'd like of both Genevieve and Elizabeth. So without further ado, let's thank Elizabeth again. We're back here at 4.30. All righty. Yes. 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 Yes.